So good afternoon and good evening. So welcome to this uh, uh, new appointment, the uh, EU in Focus uh, lecture series. My task as an historian is to do the history. And this semester also a little bit of the economy. So it was lots of fun for me to prepare um, an introduction which deals with the history of European integration and at the same time try to maintain a focus a little bit in the process of economic integration. I'm speaking from the podium more for uh, uh, recording purposes than anything else, so feel uh, free to interrupt me uh, at any moment with, with questions uh, about the elucidations or things that uh, I might not be completely clear or that just open up another uh, chapter. Let's I, I put first, I'm putting first the almost only conceptual point that I'm going to make, uh, which, is, uh, which is, let's say, about one, one day is an interpretation, a question of interpreting the history of the European Union, which is always a little problematic. So those of you who are interested in, in history and also in political science, this is, this is, I put it first because I know that you are still listening to me. When you approach the history of the EU, whether you go just browsing on the internet in the EU website or in the many sites, including Wikipedia, about the EU, or if you are opening one of the many manuals on the EU, you are confronted with a standard narration, which is very progressive, in which basically the history of the EU is narrated as a history of expansion and progression. And so basically the present is narrated and celebrated, that's the point through the past. Here I call it a progressive history, in which basically the point is more country, more treaties, more freedom, more competences, an enlarging set of competences uh, for the EU uh, into the various field that goes from coal and steel to agriculture, to trade, to competition policy, to money and ever growing like that. Uh, more democracy, even if that some of you will be familiar with the question, is more problematic as the debate on democratic deficit is always ongoing with the growth of the power of the parliament, the first election, and now really in the last uh, general, general European election, the basically voting of the people for the president of the commission. So there is a little bit of more democracy process, more integration, not, more, not only more enlargement, but more only integration. Now, this is what usually, just to give you an example, so that's a, a standard history. One can make a history of the EU just like that. And it's very often the one that we get in books, in books which are usually uh, either sociology or political science, because there is no much history done of the EU. Uh, this is one of the questions. I'm sorry, this is typical historian kind of bubbling here. Um, so this is a typical example of uh, this progressive history, works very well, and actually it's very difficult not to do it that way. The history of the enlargement that brings the countries from six to currently 28, going to the various addition, and this is also for you, you should be now, by now, able to uh, recognize the various um, uh, sort of uh, uh, countries in those little um, um, letters. So MT, Malta, Cyprus, and so on, uh, Sweden, Austria, Finland from 1995. This is an history which is of everlasting enlargement or ever growth. So the technically historians we call this teleology. Teleology. When basically a narration narrates uh, a story from the end. So when you are basically narrating a story to get to that end, not with all its kind of moments of turn, indecision, coming back and going forth, but as you are going, as you are taking out all the things that you don't like and having only the kind of linear story towards the present. 
Uh, it's like when people, you know, when people are about 50 and you ask them about their story, they usually tell that sort of story. Oh, I did this and I did that and I did that. And they completely forget about the failures they had in the meantime. So that's the typical, no, teleological story that people tell. So teleology, all things bright and beautiful. Now, of course, as a, an historian, when I hear that, I said, well, there must be something is missing here, here in this narration. And so what I'm going to provide to you only kind of in a very sketchy, partial, and uh, limited way, is a history which tries to tell you also of the ups and downs, let's say, of the failure of the, of the change, only to a limited extent, just to give you some ideas. And so we start from that. So end of the technical, let's say, conceptual um, things, we start with the actual history. And we start the ups and downs of integration one, there are eight pictures that I made, but let's say. Um, one, war and peace. So we start with war and peace, 20th century, 30 years of war, more or less, between 1914 and 1945. This has a huge impact in Europe, as the two world wars were fought in Europe, not only, but very strongly. And both of them are basically wars between France and Germany, a lot of it. A lot of it is a war between France and Germany. The question of the German problem in 1945-46 is a huge question. What, how do we solve the German problem? That's, that's very strongly there. Plus, there is the Cold War. There is setting in. So the first moment of European integration, immediately post-war, is actually a movement which is about trying to avoid another war to start. Trying to set a system that will contain Germany. That's how it starts to a good extent. And so the 1951 Treaty of Paris that established the European community of, of steel and coal is basically a way in which you share steel, which is essential to making a war, plus coal, which is also essential energy for making a war, so that you know that the Germans will not be able to build another uh, Fourth Reich, let's say, and start a new war. That's the idea. I put it there, so created out of peace concern. Peace concerns and the European community, I put it there, is actually, in the history of the subsequent decade, didn't do much to actually ensure peace, apart from some kind of um, uh, securing kind of democratic transition in certain countries. It's actually the, the Cold War that ensured the fact that there were 50 years of peace in Europe. Uh, and so we, give it, we need to give credit to the US and to the uh, USSR that there were killing each other in Vietnam, in Korea, somewhere else, but they leave us in peace, if you took from a European perspective, let's say. Very interesting, and this is a really sad back. 1954, there is this attempt of actually jumpstart the unification via a military union, a defense union, that would immediately set the course for a political union. So ra rather than going, oh, let's do the, uh, as it happened, and the economics and so on, there was actually an attempt of doing the United States of Europe, as the founding fathers were thinking, and doing it via this kind of defense alliance, the EDC, European Defense uh, Community. That was rejected in 1954, and as I said, well, too bad, let's go economics then. <laughs> it's safe, it's much less controversial. Uh, people will actually accept that. No, no people, sorry. Governments will actually accept that. They would refuse. Um, uh, it would be very difficult to accept the uh, actual political union. So economic integration and the entire history of European integration is actually the result of a setback of a political union. Uh, so let's go economic, because there is a failure in going together politically. And this is one of the points that I'm trying to make it today. To agriculture. 
Where do we start? Okay, 1954, there is that. Uh, Failure, 1955, there's a meeting in Italy, in Messina. 1957, the big Treaty of Rome, the founding, the founding stone of European integration is set. Seen from, let's say, the dream of the United States of Europe. It's, it's very ambitious, but at the same time, it's very small. It sets the coordinates in agriculture. Most of the, almost all the budget and all the effort is creating agriculture, but agriculture, in the 1950s is sort of declining in its importance. It's only less than 10%, 6%, 8% of GDP, which is a lot, but it's not a key sector anymore. The Europeans, those six countries, the states are sharing the least important sector of the economy. No industry, no services. We are sharing agriculture. It's important, but politically, much less relevant than anything else, and certainly. And so, from a setback which is in politics, the direction is integrating agriculture, which is politically, let's say, significant, but not strategic at the time, okay? So that's how, let's say, the primacy of agriculture. If you want to think a little kind of nastily, or, or actually a little aggressively about all of this, um, the, the, the focus on agriculture comes also from that. I put there, just to give you an idea, the focus of the CAP, Common Agricultural Policy, in there to stabilize markets, to secure availability of supplies, to provide consumers with food at reasonable price. It's very interesting if we look at it from and to a 21st century, um, let's say, uh, perspective, to look at the hierarchy there. Increase productivity by promoting technical progress. Second, to ensure a fair standard of living for for, to the agricultural community. And only last, to provide consumers with food at a reasonable price. I think if you would set the same priorities in the 21st century, you would find the last one much higher up, and you will find the second one much down. It's interesting that it reflects also the value of the time. Anyway, the point is agriculture because it's not strategic. Industry and the rest is kept out. And basically, for the history of the first years of European integration is easy. Nothing happens. For 20 years, 57, 77. The only event is really uh, the refusal and the entry of the UK, Denmark, Ireland. Ups and downs of integration tree. You can't trust the Brits. In the history of enlargement, the first enlargement, yeah, and the UK came in and we were all happy. No, not at all. They kept the Brits out for more than 10 years. The French didn't want the British in for a number of reasons. And, and so uh, they had to wait for the Fourth uh, uh, Republic to end uh, and the goal to be uh, finally um, uh, get into retirement uh, to get the British and so the Irish and the uh, Danish in in the in the EU. That's basically the most important things. Then the the CAP, the Common Agriculture Policy, is actually very successful. Huh? One has to say that it was very successful in creating a European agriculture and. Uh, uh, strengthening it while it was completely dying in the late 50s. The CAP was very successful. So it, it was a successful experiment in agriculture. That's it, basically, from an historical point of view. What sets in the next stage, the following period, of very interesting European integration, because European integration is an incredibly interesting process. If we look at it from 21st century, 21st century eyes in terms of globalization, Europeanization is a very interesting experiment in institutionalized globalization. So studying in European integration is incredibly interesting from, from, for us, for you, I'm sure Violet will have said much more interesting thing about why it is interesting to America. But this is a little thing I can say. 
there is a crisis, a very important crisis, that sets in in the early 70s, and that's the, uh, uh, the combination of the fact that the Americans stop stabilizing the dollar, exit Bretton Woods, and just a couple of years later, there is the oil shock. All of that sort of sends in Europe a number of messages about how unstable and weak the European uh, situation, nation state situation, and the need that actually coordinating and integrating the economies can actually uh, work in favor of uh, the, uh, um, the, the, the individual nation state, if not of the community. So it's actually European integration has receives a, a big push by that crisis by that crisis over there. And the effects come just a few years later. Things start to move at the level of the national elite. They are thinking, hey, we need to uh, sort of strengthen European coordination as we did in the agriculture, in other sectors. At this, 1979 is an incredible important year, so much that I put it in a slide on its own. It's not a year of an enlargement. It's not, there is not a treaty. But let me tell you, 1979 is probably one of the most important years in the history of European integration, even if it's not one of the standard dates, like 1986 or 1957, the various treaties of the 2004 enlargement. But I think in my own personal history of the European integration, 1979, is as important. Because there are three things that happen in that year that really sets the move for a new phase of uh, integration. Uh, those three events is the first ever election of the uh, European Parliament. After a campaign that lasts some years, there are already demonstrations starting in 76, 77, um, under the Italian presidency, there is this uh, push, and uh, it is decided that there will be an election of the European Parliament. This is, of course, it's a, it's a push in the direction of, let's say, more Europe, more integration, more political integration, uh, because elections are political. Electing the parliament means giving a face. Uh, until then, the parliament was just made of people sent by national parliaments to meet together once a month and uh, uh, eat salmon and drink champagne at the end. And that's an incredible political event that is one of the milestones. The second one is actually even more, is actually the most important, not even more important, is the most important in terms of European integration. The Cassis de Dijon sentence by the European Court of Justice is the one that sets a new principle. The fact that all the goods produced in a country needs to be um, legally acceptable in other countries. You can't, you can't pose a limit to products that are produced in other countries. Let me give you an example. Some of you in this room will have tried absinthe. Anyone? Absinthe? The drink? You can say yes. It's not, it's not good. Um, or at least you have seen it in, in, in pubs. Now, only 12 years ago, or even probably 10 years ago, absinthe was not legal here because throughout the West, it was illegal absinthe as a substance. When there was Eastern enlargement, because in the Eastern countries, absinthe was legal, it became automatically, more or less, uh, legally, legal also in the West. And so we started to get absent these weird bottles where 80% alcohol, the reason why it's so strong alcohol is because absent uh, is in such small quantity that you can never actually intoxicate yourself. You'll die of alcohol, but you will not intoxicate yourself on absent, basically. That's the philosophy of those bottles. Uh, but that's the idea that because it's legal in a country, it needs to be legal and it can be imported in other countries, exported, imported in other countries. 
before there were a number of regulation and there were also after, but let's say the Cassis de Dijon sentence, which says to the Germans that was the case, this French liqueur that you are trying to stop on technical issues, you need to let it in Germany, sets the new rule for uh, the circulation of goods in the Union. And that's absolutely, uh, uh, let's say, a milestone for economic integration. The, the third, the first attempt to do a monetary coordination of the currencies in Europe. This was part because of the high inflation and the turbulence, monetary turbulence of the uh, mid 70s, due also to uh, some turbulence in the dollar system, too. And so there was this first coordination and then failed in the 80s, but it was the first coordination of the monetary system. So, 1979 big moment in which really it sort of changed the, changed the wind. Uh, it's just the moment in which the change in wind is, is evident, let's say. Uh, from the stasis of the first 20 years into the movement, then then will follow the following uh, 25 years. What I write there, no enlargement here, no neutrality in the history of integration, 25 years of integration follow. One could say 1979, 2009 is 25 years of very strong integration. Those are the 25 years in which integration really happened. Now things are a little different. So I would set those 25 years, 1979, 2004, till the uh, Eastern enlargement. What follows the law, uh, what follows the, that, let's say if we jump the 1980, 1981, is the law's years. The laws, Jacques Delors, which was the first president of the commission to serve twice. Under his presidency, the commission took a new role, a role of vanguard, really working to, uh, to advance European integration. And the commission took a very political role, unprecedented, and that has never repeated itself. Because since the end of the presidency of the law, member states have made sure that no new the law will ever become president of the commission. And so the following president of the commission were always more moderate in terms of European. This is why he was so hated in, uh, in Britain. If you are not familiar with British sign gesture, that's the correspondent of this in, uh, in uh, uh, in, in, in British language, sign gesture. Up yours, the laws, let's, as, the, uh, as the, uh, the president of the commission was coming to Britain, uh, the sign, which is, uh, let's say, right-wing popular newspaper, was calling for a demonstration against this pro-European um, uh, important uh, uh, politician. The laws here, 1985, 1995, are tremendous advance in uh, European integration from both the political and the economic uh, point uh, of view. So we start with the single act. Some of you will already be familiar with these sort of things. Uh, signed 1986 and then forced July 1st, 1987. I put there um, some of the important things increase of your competence, increase of power in parliament, widening, blah, 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 blah. But the important thing is the removal of barriers for common market. Again, having this focus a little bit on, a, on economic integration, I put that under focus. The physical barriers, the fiscal barriers, the technical barriers. Because in order to create a common market in a European level, you needed to remove certain obstacles uh, in order for goods to be able to circulate. And those were physical barriers, okay, easy. You need to remove uh, customs, which is not so easy to remove. Right? Then fiscal barriers, avoiding that taxation is so different that becomes a barrier. Now you can play with these things to be, put barriers on foreign goods of a certain kind. It's just a question of defining definition, there are ways. And then technical barriers. If you are saying, for instance, that 
cheese is produced in a certain way and cheese from another country is produced in another way, you can say, that's no cheese, we can't import it. That's a barrel which is made on technical arguments. Lots of countries confronted with free trade challenges use this sort of means because they say, oh, we are for free trade too. But actually they introduce a technical thing. A car needs to have this, and only cars produced in that country have that thing. At that point, import car, I need to be remade, refused, or... National regulation can be extremely, extremely, um, uh, uh, let's say, uh, works extremely well to maintain barriers among countries in terms of, of creating. So, setting up the removal of the bars by 1992 was a very important thing for, uh, for uh, um, uh, in, set in, uh, in the single European act. And bang, arrives the fall of the Berlin Wall. Now, in the uh, West, people tend to think that uh, oh, we contributed, we were so happy. No, it wasn't like that. We were completely taken by surprise by the fall of the Berlin Wall. And actually, not much in the United States, but in Western Europe, nobody wanted it. The Italians didn't want, the British completely opposed, they called, they called the Russians, I please stop, stop this, please send the tanks, kill them all, we don't want, we don't want the, 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 the Berlin Wall to fall. The same the French, everybody was so incredibly scared of what was happening in the East about it. Uh, Margaret Thatcher was appalled by the idea of German unification. German unification was a nightmare for Western European. Say, no, we don't want this. It was actually, they all happened in the East without the West actually saying anything. Very interesting to study, very interesting. But we are not interested in that here, but the effects on European integration are gigantic. Because from the next day, the question once German unification is in the, in, the, in the game, and then two years later, the fall of the Soviet Union kind of sends astray all the geopolitics of the past. The question is, Germany is now, changes from being one of the three big countries, or the four big countries of the EU, Germany, Italy, France, and Great Britain, in terms of population and political way, to be the biggest one, full stop. 80 million inhabitants against 60. It means more seat in the parliament, more power in the commission. Nobody wants German unification, also because of that. Not only because of that, but also because of that. And then when there is the demise of the Soviet in 1991, there is the entire question what to do with the East, the issue of Eastern enlargement is immediately in the agenda. And so, let's say European leaders are busy sort of thinking about the single market and removal of fiscal balance, and the next day, oh, what? oh, sorry, we need to think about the East. It's a big shift in the priority, in the schedule, everything kind of uh, needs to be redrawn. And some of the difficulties with also jumpstart in the Euro and certain other things can be explained uh, that way. The Treaty of the European Union was in preparation, so they continue. Um, you, I, I'm not going to enter in the question of the three pillars, but it's a big reorganization. Let's say that the former community was the former community set in 1950s was more or less these and was enlarged, and then the um, the uh, uh, the Maastricht Treaty adds these two pillars, as they were called. I'm going to concentrate again on the economic side of it with the single market. The shift into the single market is, which was already, let's say, set in the CEA, uh, was the big kind of uh, uh, shift. And uh, from common market to single market, let's read first actually the thing on the right. The full freedom that you have probably heard already, people, money, goods, and services. So a single market is something where all those things can
can circulate freely. A little bit like what happens in a normal country, no? Of course, making goods circulate is just a question of having good kind of labor, multilingual things. It's, it's complicated, but it's doable. Services is already pretty complicated. Uh, because having an insurance in one country and selling your services in another country with different legislations, that's, you need a lot of adjustment. And goods are already complicated, services even more. People is incredibly difficult because it's one thing freedom to travel for fun, that's all right, no problem with that. But freedom to travel for work, that's complicated. Things for instance, simply in terms of recognizing degrees from one country to another. Uh, do we trust medical school in Poland? Of course we do. Then you start and say, oh well, do, they don't study this, we study this, and they do the same with us, and so on, and we don't recognize them, and then they don't recognize us. That's just too sad. But even more, or just to go even more easy. <sighs> Language. It's not easy to reset, to resettle somewhere when you don't speak the language. The question of language remains as the major barrier for, uh, let's say, people move. But that's the full, full freedom of the movement. The limit set in the single market for, uh, for uh, uh, free trade are those three. The only limits that we can recognize, health, consumer protection, fair competition. So. If there is issues of health, then we can stop the free circulation. Uh, the mad cow disease was the test case for that. Consumer protection, like from bribes, from uh, uh, faulty uh, uh, products and things like that, La labeling, unclear labeling, untrue documents or information and so on. As they were setting these sort of limits, actually, in the Europe of the 1990s, there was a certain awareness of the fact that market, my last point there, market forces tend to reinforce the center. And so that there would be a center, which is basically Germany, France at the time, Northern Italy, Belgium, that area there, that's the center. That area is going to be reinforced by free market. But peripheral area are going to be not as uh, favored by the process of market integration. At that point, a number of instruments, which basically were the reinforcement of structural and regional funds, to be distributed somehow at the borders or to those who had, let's say, were not so far favored by the single market. I'm going now to spend two minutes on one very important point in all of these focusing, zooming down on fair competition. Because fair competition, competition policy, is one of the most striking example of um, policy making in the EU, which has contributed to economic integration of the area. The Commission has taken the role of enforcing fair competition, because, because competition is not a natural thing in the market. Only in certain condition, competition functions alone. But uh, when expanding market, for instance, new markets, that's where competition functions quite easily alone. But in very mature markets, competition tends to be uh, disrupted or, uh, let's say, adjusted a lot. So enforcing competition in the single market was one of the big job of the 90s, 2000, really. Those 20 years are very interesting for what happened in terms of uh, competition policy. These are the role that the commission took on in enforcing and supervising uh, comp market competition in the, uh, in the single market. Antitrust to prevent cartel abuses and abuses of dominant position, price fixing, these sort of things that companies usually kind of uh, make agreements in order to avoid uh, competing. 
with the power of Levy, fine. Uh, this is the famous move to career, the, uh, uh, one of the um, uh, Italian commissioners and prime minister Mario Monti did, the huge fine of Microsoft uh, that made his career because he kind of seemed like a, a, a sort of Robin Hood or a Don Quixote uh, going against Microsoft. Um, he actually now sits in the board of Microsoft because he does. Uh, um, anyway, but he did, uh, he did that move and was a very strong competition antitrust thanks to uh, having um, Microsoft to release its core code. Supervising state aid so the, uh, the, the governments, national government, won't use state aid to, uh, let's say, uh, maneuver around competition. Breaking up state monopolies, breaking up state monopolies. Now you have competition in telephone, competition in cell phone, competition in energy. Uh, all of that wasn't here 30 years ago. It's a new thing in Europe. And all of that was enforced by splitting the national monopolies and then merging them together. It was an incredible operation in the 1920s, a very huge operation that the, uh, the commission was responsible for. Merger policy, exactly. You need to split and then you need to merge because actors need to be big enough to compete. So if you want, again, to understand what it means to integrating, really, integrating, really, concretely, you need to get into these things to really understand what it means. Removing fiscal barriers, these things, these petty, these are not petty, but let's say these technical things that I've been touching uh, over my presentation, like removing fiscal barriers or the freedom, all these things, absolutely essential. Okay. Ups and downs, 60 euro. I'm going to say just one thing of the EU. I need to speed up a little bit. Um, uh, only one thing about the euro, which clarify what is particular about the euro. The euro is the only currency without a king that ever existed, it seems. Since if you study the history of currency, of money, of coins, coins exist for 3,000 years, and there is always one side with the head of the king in the beginning. So you become the king, you become the emperor, you become the ruler, you, you mint the coin and you put your head. That's a sign of sovereignty. Money is connected to a sovereign power. The euro is the first ever, it seems, money that has no political power behind. There is no political power in Brussels to back the euro as there is in, in Peking uh, to back the yuan or in uh, uh, Washington to back uh, the Federal Reserve. It's unique. And it's incredible that it is reflected in the actual banknotes. When have you ever seen a banknote without somebody in it. There's always a president, an historical figure, a queen, a king. That's normal. It has always been like that. In the Euro, when they created the Euro, they couldn't agree on who to put it. And this is a reflection of the lack of an existing power behind. There are lots of funny stories about this. They were proposing, oh, let's put, uh, let's put uh, important philosophers, but they are all Germans or Greek, and so it wasn't good for the French and the Italians. So let's put uh, uh, musicians, but again, too many Germans, but yeah. Um, anyway, so in the end, they couldn't agree. They put windows and, and doors, and fun fact, the French managed to smuggle one of their bridges in the five euro. That's a, fr that's a bridge, a Roman bridge, in the, uh, in the south of France. It was supposed to be um, by invention, but actually is, a, is an actual bridge. Anyway, a French always kind of, you can't trust the French either, can you? This is the progression of country getting into the euro. It's interesting that it's continuing to happen even within the crisis because of the, let's say there is an obligation to take over the euro uh, if you enter the EU. 
And so as the crisis is going, you see the uh, countries in the east are still kind of getting the, uh, starting to use the euro and they hope it's going to work. Okay, I'm basically at the end. I finish up with this unusual picture of uh, Eastern enlargement. I'm almost finishing up with Eastern enlargement. This is a picture which is not, so that's, uh, uh, Eastern enlargement is in this area. This is a picture, however, which is not taken from the usual Eastern, uh, Eastern enlargement pictures, but it's taken from the um, um, distributing aid according to uh, the level of poverty or richness. And so you see that the blue area, which is the center I was talking to you uh, before, the blue area, is the area which is above 100% of, national, uh, of uh, European GDP per capita. While the red area in the West are the previous area that would receive help as being peripheral in relation to the, let's say, single market in the center. But if you look, the entire eastern area that entered in 2004, 2007, actually f um, the red part is where the average GDP per capita falls under 75% of the, of the average European level. So these people are really poor, and actually these people over here are actually around, at that time, 40%, 50%. So you can imagine how imbalance, and this was one of the challenges of Eastern enlargement, the imbalance of the new countries in relation to the existing one. Uh, it's completely different economic output. And this is, I think it's a good way to start thinking about Eastern enlargement. It's certainly one of the important things to think about. Last slides is just opening up to, um, as an historian, I decide to stop 10 years ago, not getting to the present. But of course, we can have fun later with that. What has happened since Eastern enlargement till today is that the push of integration has been, um, it's not substituted, but there is a now a kind of counter shift with the nation state that strikes back. Since 2005, but you can push it even before, or you can start it a little later, there has been, let's say, movement of the various nation states to stop the movement of integration and recuperate some of the lost influence, if not power, directing the situation, directing it, and stopping European integration. So that's what has happened in the last 10 years. So that has been a strong movement in the last 10 years, is the strike back of the nation state in relation to the pushes for European integration, which, as, as you remember, was very strong between 79 and 2004, at least in this interpretation. In the last 10 years, there is this pushback for, uh, towards the nation state, the nation state to recuperate. See reason about okay. If we want, we can discuss that. So I finish here, and uh, we now have some time for uh, questions. And I'll actually um, uh, get off the uh, podium here for that session. Thank you. I should remind you that you should use uh, the microphone if you want to make questions. I was just wondering, you said earlier that um, the original member states did not want um, Britain it, it, to be a part of it, and I was just wondering why, if why? it can be explained quickly or not. <laughs> yes, well, let's say there are two main reasons that are worth mentioning, uh, let's say, here. One is uh, the fact that uh, the, in the original six at the time, so we're talking about the 50s, um, France had basically the, not the monopoly, but basically the direction of the game. Because Germany was still under the spell of the war. So they, they need to, to, to stay sit and quiet. 
and say yes. Uh, you've been bad, you behave. Um, and so the French had all the power. Having the British getting in would mean changing the power balance in the system, and so that was certainly something that wasn't particularly, let's say, pleasurable. The second reason is that already at the time, the British were felt as being um, extremely close to American politics. And so it was felt that the level of independence of European decision making would decrease in relation to the United States. Because the, the, the British would function as a sort of voice of the United States inside the Union. So that's, those are two of the reasons which, uh, which were there. There were others, like more kind of economic based about the places of French agriculture with the arrival of British and so on. But let's say those two were the political ones. Thank you. Um, so you said in the beginning of the uh, European Committee, the formation, that the initial idea was to form a military union or a political, political union. So the, in the inception of the forming of the European Committee uh, in the 1950s, yes. the initial conception was to form um, a military union. Yes, yes. yes. and uh, my question is, um, do you think there is a, because down the road there will be further European integration, so do you think there is a possibility of again a military integration, a military union in the future? Well, uh, the answer is at the same time there are experiments. There is the U4, uh, which is actually uh, the military force of the European Union. It actually exists. Uh, it's small, it's, uh, it's mostly symbolic, but it, it exists. And there are a number of, of operations which have been made, one in Lebanon, I think, four years ago, which was made, let's say, uh, by the European policy. However, the question is four letters, N-A-T-O. NATO is the real thing. That's the, that's, the, that's the big elephant in the room of anything military. So is, uh, what would a European whatever means if we are in NATO and NATO is the, uh, the, the actor who is actually leading the dance and, and playing the music and deciding where to go. So there could be, but the, there is the question of NATO there. That's, that's the real thing. Um, you were saying that um, f like in the European Union, there has to be free movement of people and goods. And you mentioned the thing about medical schools and how um, they were being taught different things. And um, I was wondering if now like everything is regulated so that doctors can freely move from different countries. Uh, so now, doctors, of course, are, um, let's say, a very uh, strong, let's say, sensi sensitive point because, I mean, they work in hospital to save life. And people actually may also be a little, let's say, resisting if they see somebody with don't speak exactly the same language and so on. So it's all very sensitive also, let's say, on a communicational identity and finally political thing. Um, the, so doctors, yes, they can do it, is, uh, is actually uh, working. Um, the, the, the actual final answer to you is there is one thing called Bologna process. The Bologna process started in the 90s, uh, is a process in which the, uh, um, the universities of the, of the European countries go together, first time in Bologna, because it's the oldest university in the world and it's uh, just 80 kilometers from here, uh, 50 miles from here, and uh, uh, they gathered together and they started a process in which they would coordinate their policy about um, credits, about um, uh, number of years for uh, the various kind of studies and so on, trying to create curriculum that are speaking to each other. 
And so uh, now we are um, about 15 years down the line, or maybe less than 15, down the line from in the Bologna process, there's been another convention in Valencia and so on. The process is continuing uh, of creating a, let's say, not a single European system, but national system that can relatively uh, move, uh, can, where you can circulate and you can actually graduate from one uh, or another and uh, work in other countries. Um, this is, uh, let's say, university is one thing, professional recognition is another. So it's not enough to graduate in, in many countries to be recognized as a professional in that area. In Italy, you don't need, it's not enough to graduate in law to be a lawyer, you need to pass another exam. I don't know how it is, but it's the same in many other countries. Now, the question of having those titles recognized is yet another one. So it's not a question that you solve only via the university, but you need to have a number of national other institutions to be coordinated. It's very complicated, that. But it's one of the, that's why the movement of professional is difficult. It's difficult because there are many, many, uh, let's say, elements that, uh, that uh, come into operation in, uh, in, in creating those possibilities. And this is only, let's say, from the purely professional without all the question of how easy it is to buy a house, how easy it is to uh, settle, how easy it is to pay taxes in another country, all of those things. All collecting your pension or retirement contribution in a country, in another country, if you're going to retire or not. That's all. Really, really. To, to coordinate all of that among 27 or 18 or whatever is really, really difficult. And all of that without a political center. You, you can see how, how complex it is, that, all, all that sort of process of coordination, integration. Uh, much more, unfortunately, complicated than making goods sort of go around. Uh, isn't Germany the political power behind the euro? Sorry. Isn't Germany the political power behind the euro? If the answer is yes, and one could answer yes, yes, they are the political power that is leading Europe currently. That's, that's also becomes a huge problem. Because if the political power is Germany, at that point is me is is evident that uh, you uh, the other country is not going to follow easily and willingly. So, if that is the case, then it's a problem. Um, uh, can, it be, can it be no Germany? Probably not. The question, a little bit, is uh, the changed attitude of the Germans in the last decade. I was talking with a German friend um, uh, about a month ago about this, and she was saying about something like what happened with Greece would have never happened when Germany was West Germany. That sort of very harsh positioning uh, over a country, not that the Greek didn't merit what they had, but let's say to actually punish them that way, um, is something that wouldn't have happened with Western, with the Federal Republic of Western Germany. Um, this shift in position somewhat is not posing as a political leadership. If you want to be a political center, you need to pose yourself a political center. You can't act on your own. It's a little bit what the United States did under Bush. They started to act on their own, do, oh, well, who cares? And of course, they lost political leadership. Because if you act like that, then you lose political leadership. And the Germans have done a little bit the same. They started to act a little bit too much on their own. And part of that is the fact that the people around started to look and say, well, then 
you are not anymore acting as a leader. Let's say a leader needs to act in a certain way in order to be followed, to people to follow. There's a question, it's called hegemony. If you want to look for that word, it's called hegemony. A leader needs to exert hegemony. If you start to doing certain acts which are very clearly on your own narrow self-interest or whatever you perceive as that, then you lose a German and you lose leadership. That's a little bit my, my perception in relation to Germany. You had said that there are um, issues with integration of the euro into Eastern Europe, and I was wondering what those may be. The issues with the integration of the euro into Eastern Europe? The question of, uh, of so one of the questions is the fact that the euro is, you need certain, uh, certain uh, uh, let's say, criteria to get in. Those criteria are relatively uh, difficult to obtain for many countries in Eastern Europe. So over the course of the last uh, five years, there's been a number of Eastern countries who got in. Who got in uh, basically because they are small countries that they don't threaten the euro. So Slovakia, the three Balkan, uh, Baltic countries, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, go in on the basis that these economies are so small that they don't threaten. Hence, uh, they had good policies, they followed the criteria, but also, let's say, they are unthreatening. Much more difficult is the question of larger economic uh, situation, uh, larger economic unit like Poland, or more complicated, not to say something else, situation like Romania and Bulgaria. So getting those countries to get out of the euro, that's, that's going to be a little uh, complicated. Poland will, will arrive, the other two is unknown what will happen. So that's, that's, that's one thing I can say about integrating the euro over there. That's why when you travel to Poland, you don't, you don't have the euro. It's a little too big at the moment uh, to, uh, to get the euro without threatening the, uh, the entire, the entire uh, currency. Okay. Thank you very much, then.